can see it on the screen there. Oh, wow. Now all you have to do to put it on the blimp is just flip just, that switch okay. and push that button right there. Great. Three, two, one. Just call. Just call. I mean, we call. Do you know that right now experiments are going on that would allow human beings to communicate with animals? Now, for instance, wouldn't you get a kick out of it if I could communicate with this little ant that's right in my hand? Now, I've been doing some of these experiments, so I'm a little further ahead than most of the scientists. We'll give it a try. How are you, Charlie? Fine, James. How about yourself? Can't complain? Did you hear the one about the guy who was so dumb he went to a football game because he thought a quarterback was a cash refund. <laughs> well, you get the idea, anyway. And <laughs> there's, there's lots of ends. <laughs> Communication. So I'll have a double cheeseburger. And my friend here, who seems to like you a lot, <laughs> yes, can take nice weight. He'll have a vanilla shake, and french fries, and a hot apple pie. Yes? Yes, who? This is Chantek, and he's almost two years old. And he goes to the University of Tennessee, where he's learning how to talk in sign language. And this is his teacher, Dr. Lynn Miles. Why are you teaching an orangutan sign language? Well, we want to see how intelligent orangutans are, and we want to know if, like uh, babies, Orangutans can learn to use language. No, you have to swallow it. He's just like a little baby. Oh, he really is. I'm not sure if he wants to keep... Come on. How many signs does he know? It's, it's, it's nice and cold, and that's why he's yeah. playing with it. He knows about ten signs. He knows how to say food and drink. He can sign up, and one of his favorite signs is go. He really likes to be on the go. Can you teach me some of the signs? Sure, I'd really like to. And I can also show you how we teach the signs to Chantek. This is the sign for bread, as if you're slicing some bread. And Chantek loves his rice bread. Now, this might be a little hard for Chantek, because it's a two-handed sign. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Nice. <laughs> He's trying to take it. What is it? What is it? It's food. And I'm going to tell you what kind of food it is, Chantek. It's bread. Bread. Bread food. Bread. Okay, right now he doesn't look like he's paying much attention. But after doing this many, many times, he'll make the connection between the bread sign and the rice bread that I'm feeding him. And then in order to get the rice bread, he'll have to sign for it. He'll have to ask for it just the way a baby does. Chase? Okay. Do you want Could you chase? The chase sign is just like this. It's like one person's chasing another. And when you catch them, you sign caught. But Chantek uses a, a baby talk version of sign. Instead of using both of his hands, he signs with just one hand like this and wiggles his thumb. That's chase. And you have to watch really carefully to see him do it. Because if you don't know the signs, it will look like maybe he's just moving or wiggling his hand. Chase. OK. Chase. He knows that. Oh, oh he oh. does. Look at him. Well, sign. 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 Wh what? What? Chase. Good sign. Good sign. I caught you. I caught you. Uh, Lynn, do you think that someday apes will be able to talk just like people do? Well, a chimpanzee and orangutan have been taught to say a couple of words. They could say mama and papa, but it's really not possible for apes 
to say all the words in human speech, the shape of their vocal tract doesn't allow them to make the sounds that you and I can. And that's why we use a non-vocal way to communicate with these animals. Apes and chimps can learn a simple sign language, but better when they're older. A baby like Chantek really needs a few more years before he's ready to communicate like this big fella over here. Tell me what you want. It's a big deal. You communicate with Planet of the Apes over here. Or an ant. Well, how about really reaching out? Like to outer space. Like to her friends. Hey, where is she from, anyhow? Some planet with a lot of bathrooms. So you really want to communicate with other beings, huh? You got it. But how do you know they're there? Oh, they're there, all right. It's like taking a message, stuffing it in a bottle, and throwing it in the ocean. Only no ocean, just base. Toss it out there, the bottle just keeps falling and falling. Until somebody catches it. Yeah, but suppose the being's out there just like you. How do you mean? Can't catch. Mark! Hey, well, maybe we should be trying to find out how they communicate. Yeah, sure. Give them a yell. Hey, you, Greeny! Hey, you, Butterfingers! No, really, I mean, we should try and find out how they speak, or if they speak, or what they speak. I mean, do they beep, or honk, or uh, whir, or swear? How do their minds work? Do you speak? How do you communicate? <laughs> Those are words. How many syllables? It's not a language problem, it's a time problem. So take time. 40,000 years? Out there in the stardust, that's about the closest doorbell. And when you get there, who knows if there's even gonna be a record player? Here, take that, go ahead, okay? Chase, Chase, go, go. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then put it on, okay? Over there, all right? Gold? Yep. A golden oldie? New release. What's it called? Earth Sounds. NASA. NASA? Is that the name of a new group? <clears throat> National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Hello from the children of planet Earth. They recorded all the sounds everything around here makes. The real Earth as a single to send out on the Voyager spacecraft so other beings can groove on our sounds. Even millions of years from now. Never stay top 40 that long.
Earth. Earth. Really rocking. Next, you get the jungle doing a big solo. <laughs> he really digs it. <laughs> yeah, but does she? But what good is it if they know what we sound like, if they don't know what we look like? I mean, she says she's a she, right? But do we ever get to see she's a she? Mm -hmm. That's why NASA also sends along this space plaque on all our spacecraft with data and directing. Now, there's a spacecraft, and there's a typical male and female Earthling. Boy, it's a lot of women. Hmm, he's a pretty big dude himself. NASA made a mistake. A mistake? Mm -hmm. NASA. Those are grown-ups. They didn't include any of us. Should have brought the kids. On our second honeymoon? I miss them. But look at it all out there, Ethel. You're seeing Mars. You're seeing Jupiter. And the one with all the rings, uh, Saturn. If that's Saturn, it must be Saturday. The kids will all be home. We're over a billion miles from home, Ethel, and headed out of the solar system for a gala eon, all at taxpayer expense. They could have come family rate. We're going Star Trekking. Enough about the kids. Who's the one still waving to them? <clears throat> Habit. Thank heaven the office can't reach you. Look, thinking was such a big deal and all. Maybe we've got it backwards. Want to scrub Bert and Ethel? No. Do all we can to communicate with them. But keep on checking to see if maybe they're trying to communicate with us. Space scientists have built big radio telescopes right into the Earth to pick up signals from outer space. This huge disk is really an antenna to catch signals, which is sort of how my radio works. But it's not like any telescope I ever saw. Can I ask you something? Sure. Go ahead. I know this doesn't really look like the telescopes that I use in school and right. stuff. How is this the telescope and how is it used? Well, we work with uh, radio waves instead of light waves, of which you're more familiar with. Human beings can, of course, detect radio waves. We need an instrument like a radio receiver. It's like having a large uh, mirror for a regular telescope. We have a very large reflector for our telescope. And from this point in Puerto Rico, we have a very nice view of the sky directly above us, the, the universe that passes overhead, which includes most of all the planets and the sun and the moon. Do you really think there's life out, out there in outer space? I'd say the chances are very good. The only reason is, is because there's so many possibilities. Well, how would you find out if there was? Well, well, some of the work that we do is listening. The signal would be very special. It would be very different. It would be very different from all the other signals that we receive. And that's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, when we do those programs, we're Did looking for a signal that's unique. Right. Say we went downstairs later to the control room, and they came up to you and they said, hey, we got a signal. We got a signal. What would you do? A couple of times they've received signals that are very suspicious. And it turns out, after they examined it over and carefully, then they saw and they found out that those signals actually came from Earth. Is it true that they sent a message into outer space once? That's right. 
in uh, November of 1974, uh, we transmitted a coded signal from here to uh, M13, which is a globular cluster of stars uh, near our Milky Way. What was said in the message? Like, I mean, what would you send out there to someone? I mean, if there is someone out there. Well, the first thing that had to be decided was how were you going to send a message so that someone else who you don't even know how they speak or think or what they look like could translate it. Okay. And it was determined that the common language of anybody in space that could receive our signal would be mathematics. So they sent a mathematical signal. Why did they send such a complicated message? I mean, why didn't they just send one that said, Hi, here's a message from Earth. We'd like to hear from you. How are you going to say that? Oh. <laughs> We can't do that. The only thing that we have in common with any other beings, like I said, one is mathematics, and the other thing is going to be chemistry. Well, how do we know that? I mean... Because mathematics is the same everywhere. Ev I mean, everywhere. how can you say that? I mean, it could... Certainly. If you can count to one through ten or on, you must know how to count. But that's like when they say that there can't be anything out there unless it breathes what we breathe. Not necessarily. If they're technologically superior enough to receive our signal, they certainly know how to count. And they certainly know how to use chemistry. All of the chemical elements that we know saying? here on Earth are the same everywhere in space. How long would the message that was sent from here take to get to M... What did you 13. Say? M13. Yeah. M13 is going to take about 24,000 years just to get there. Who's going to hear it? You mean when if, the if answer they... comes back? Yeah, how long will it take for the answer to come back? <laughs> Another 24,000 years, if the message travels at the speed but of the light. But the people who send it from here aren't going to be, who's going to be here to hear it? Probably nobody. Do you think, you think the human race won't be here anymore by that time? Well, if we're not careful, we probably won't be. Okay, I'll buy that. But do you think they'd ever really try to come? Themselves? Maybe they're already here. You're both wrong. Been and gone. We are entering Earth orbit. Remember L-33, our mission is to communicate with Earthlings. Look, an Earthling, I will compute. You record, let's go. Hello, Earthling, we are from outer space. Who is in charge here? Compute, compute. Thank you, thank you. The Earthling says to follow rolling one. Oops, large earthling just ate the rolling earthling. Hello, we are from outer space. Who is in charge here? Compute, compute. It's a wind up, the pitch, it's a hit. Yes, it's over the fence. Compute, compute, thank you. Let's report back to the council. We have communicated with the Earthlings data. Compute, 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 compute. I thought the Earthlings would be more like us. It'll take longer than I thought to learn their language. Happy to assist you. Compute, compute, the Bloodhound Gang. Whenever there's trouble, well, there are the double with the Bloodhound Gang. If you've got the crime, we've got the time with the Bloodhound Gang. Hi, Ricardo. Grab a card, beautiful. I'm jogging. Come on, Vicky, it's a new trick. Grab a card. Now, 
watch the great Ricardo. Six of diamonds, right? <laughs> Wrong. Jack of clubs, right? Wrong. <laughs> Bloodhound Detective Agency, whenever there's trouble with they're on the double. Mr. Bloodhound isn't here. Yes. Yes. Ace of clubs. Right. Yeah, I knew I'd get it. Wrong. He's got a sitting on the reading of Mr. Fowler's will. The bird man? Yeah, but his will smells fishy. <laughs> doing? Following you. I'm practicing shadowing criminals. Thanks a lot. Come on, kid. We're on a case. Bloodhound Detective Agency. Yes, I called. I'm Amanda Fowler. Come in. handling matters, and I don't trust him. He's due at any moment. I have a copy of the old will, but the lawyer says my uncle changed it. Something about passenger pigeon. American passenger pigeon. 1914. Gone, but not forgotten. All present? I believe I'm the only heir, Mr. Pettifog. We'll see. We'll see. What do you think? A crook? I, Aurelius Fowler, being of sound mind and judgment, revoke all earlier wills and codicils and declare this to be my last will and testament. First, uh, to my niece and only living relative, Amantha Fowler of London, England, who does not share my scholarly interest in bird life, I leave the sum of uh, one dollar. Second, I give, leave, and bequeath the remainder of my estate to the Committee for the uh, <clears throat> Care and Preservation of the American Passenger Pigeon. Cough. Quick. Slip out and call the Audubon Society. What's that? They know all about birds. Find out if that committee is on the up and up. Private for the staff. Finally, I appoint as the chairman of the committee and the executor of this will, my dear friend, attorney, and a fellow expert on birds, Hiram G. Pettifog. That's me. Hello? Is this the Attabo? I mean, Audubon Society? Well, this is Bloodhound Detective Agency, and I need some information on the Committee for the Care and Preservation for the American Passenger Pigeon. Yeah, it's important. I authorize my executor to sell, with or without notice, at either public or private sale. No such committee. Yeah, there might have been before 1914. 1914? Good work, Cuff. Signed and sealed, etc., etc. That won't be necessary. The will is a fake. Why, well, I'll stake my uh, <clears throat> reputation on it. What reputation? You don't know beans about birds. And that's exactly how you tripped yourself up. The clue was in the will and on that bird. The will cuts Ms. Amantha Fowler of London, England, out of her uncle's estate, right? Because she doesn't know much about birds. American birds, anyway. Precisely. The will also states that you are a bird expert. Exactly. Kindly read paragraph two again, Mr. Pettiford. The part about bequeath. I have no time for this nonsense. Read it, Mr. Pettiford. 
I give, leave, and bequeath the remainder of my estate to the uh, Committee for the Care and Preservation of the American Passenger Pigeon. Mr. Fowler was a famous bird man. He would never have agreed to that paragraph. You forged the will. How dare you make such a charge? Because Mr. Fowler knew, positively knew, all about the passenger pigeon. That's why he put gone but not forgotten on that bird. There used to be billions of those pigeons, thick as buffaloes, until they got wiped out. Care to read what this book has to say? Not one bird left alive. They've been extinct since 1914. He won't get far. I've taken pictures of him, his car, and his license. The police will pick him up. We can file them under Jailbird. Another case closed. Chalk another one up for the Bloodhound Gang. Yeah. Hey, what was that card you chose? King of Diamonds. Now watch the great Ricardo. <laughs> Presto. File that under Amazing. Three Two One Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop.